This chapter is over the autonomic nervous system. And the autonomic nervous system is a system that's out of your control. Um, it controls such things as glands of the body, cardiac muscle, and smooth muscle. Primary target organs are the organs that are located in the thoracic cavity and the abdominal cavity. Again, the autonomic nervous system is involuntary and the effectors, the effectors are the cardiac muscle, glands, and smooth muscle. They do not depend on the autonomic nervous system to function, but they adjust their activity. So here's where we are with the nervous system. We started um, back in chapter 11 going over uh, nervous tissue. Then we went to chapter 12, and chapter 12 focused on the central nervous system. Chapter 13 was the peripheral nervous system. We had the sensory um, afferent division bringing in information from receptors, and then the motor efferent division. The somatic nervous system was connected to muscles of the body, and these are skeletal muscles. And now those were our main effectors that we were talking about in Chapter 13. And this system, uh, the autonomic nervous system, which is covered in Chapter 14, um, the effectors are different. Remember, cardiac muscles, smooth muscle, glands of the body. And there are two divisions within this autonomic nervous system, the sympathetic division and the parasympathetic division. Now, the sympathetic division, um, I like to call it the E system because E stands for excitement, emergency, exercise, embarrassment, anything that revs the body up for a um, situation where you have to increase alertness and prepare the body for an emergency. So what it does is increases alertness, increases heart rate, blood pressure, increases blood flow to uh, the pulmonary um, circulation to increase airflow, uh, blood glucose levels increase, and also increases blood flow to cardiac and skeletal muscles. So it reduces the blood flow to skin and GI tract. It's also called the fight or flight response and the tone, sympathetic tone is vasoconstriction. The parasympathetic division, resting and digesting system, I like to call that the D division. Now resting doesn't start with a D, but digesting does. And so does diuresis, which means peeing and defecation, which is pooping. So all the housekeeping chores of the body usually occur best when the parasympathetic division is at work. And the parasympathetic tone maintains smooth muscle tone, which is located in your hollow organs, the stomach, the small and large intestines, bladder, and lowers the heart rate. Now, one of the things you want to um, keep in mind about this system Remember when we talked about nervous system pathways, we said sensory information comes in and that's the afferent pathway. Then you have the integration center in the central nervous system and the efferent pathway is the motor pathway going out to effectors. Well, in the autonomic nervous system, instead of it being a one neuron, uh, one neuron in the pathway, there's two neurons in the chain. And when you have two neurons connected together, the first neuron is going to originate from the central nervous system, and then it's going to make a synapse with a second neuron that's outside the central nervous system. So where that presynaptic neuron attaches to the next neuron, that cell, those cell bodies of the postsynaptic neuron, they collect together, and a collection of nerve cell bodies outside the central nervous system is called a ganglion. So that's why they use this term preganglionic neuron. So the first neuron in the chain is called the preganglionic neuron, starts in the central nervous system, has a thin, lightly myelinated preganglionic axon. Then the postganglionic act neuron in the autonomic ganglion is outside the central nervous system. It's non-myelinated, the axon, and it extends to whatever the effector organ is. So here's a picture. This kind of will make it a little bit easier for you to see. But what we've talked about so far in Chapter 13, looking at nerves that attach to skeletal muscles, 
they're very heavily myelinated and see how there's only one neuron that goes out to the muscle. It releases acetylcholine as the neurotransmitter that stimulates the skeletal muscle. That's what we've already talked about. Now, when we look at the autonomic nervous system, there's two. One, two here for the sympathetic division. One, two here for the parasympathetic division. And the thing is that the preganglionic axon, lightly myelinated, here is your second neuron. There's the nerve cell body. And remember, by definition, a collection of nerve cell bodies outside the central nervous system is called a ganglion. So there's your ganglion. And then postganglionic axon, non-myelinated. And the same thing here. Okay? The only difference is with the sympathetic system, you have this one nerve that connects to a gland called the adrenal gland. And in the adrenal medulla, you're going to produce these um, neurotransmitters that are called epinephrine and norepinephrine, which go into the bloodstream, and they represent the adrenaline rush that you experience when you're having a sympathetic response. So that's the different connection between these pathways that go to various effectors here and here. This goes right to the adrenal medulla, and it... Uh, gives more of a influence um, of the sympathetic system as having a full body response. Okay, so the sympathetic division is called the thoracolumbar division because the nerves that supply fibers to the to the effectors come from um, spinal nerves T1 through L2. And in the sympathetic division, the first neuron in the chain has very short axons and very long postganglionic axons, and they call axons fibers, okay? So these very short preganglionic fibers result in ganglion that actually are very close to the spinal cord where these, nerves, where these nerve cell bodies originate from. So those ganglia are located outside the vertebral column and there's widespread connection within the ganglia. And that makes the sympathetic effect very far-reaching due to the inter intercommunications within the ganglia. So this, these are called paravertebral ganglia. They vary in size, position, and number, but there's actually 23 paravertebral ganglia in the sympathetic trunk, and they line up and make a chain, and they're all connected. And here's the breakdown. Three cervical, 11 thoracic, four lumbar, four sacral, one coccygeal. And the effectors and these response of these um, paravertebral vertebrae, their connections to nerves, exit out and the postganglionic neurons go to these various effectors. The spinal nerve root goes to sweat glands, erector pili muscles, blood uh, vessels and of the skin and skeletal muscles. Then you have the sympathetic root that connects to um, organs in the thoracic cavity, so heart, lungs, esophagus, thoracic blood vessels. And then the splanchnic nerve root goes to the organs in the abdominal pelvic cavities. So you can see here all the different divisions um, that serve all of those organs. This is a picture that shows you the preganglionic neurons. They originate from the spinal cord, T1 through L2. And then very short um, preganglionic axons. And then here are your paravertebral ganglion. That's the chain. They all link together. And then you have very long postganglionic fibers that go out to the individual organs. So if you look at page two of the notes, about a third of the way down the top of the page, um, I just want to go over this one section so that you can see why the sympathetic effect has a full body type of action, okay, its response. There is no simple one-to-one -one relationship between preganglionic and postganglionic neurons in the sympathetic division. Each postganglionic cell may receive synapses from multiple preganglionic cells. This is called neuronal convergence. Also, each preganglionic fiber branches and synapses with multiple postganglionic fibers, and that's called neuronal divergence. The sympathetic division has very far-reaching effects due to the divergence to different effectors. So it is 
like I said earlier, a full body response. Now the parasympathetic division is called the cranial sacral division because the nerves that supply the effectors come from the cranial nerves and some are sacral nerves. Now you'll notice a difference here. You have long preganglionic fibers from the brainstem and the sacrum and they extend from the central nervous system almost to the target organ and they synapse with postganglionic neurons in terminal ganglia close to or they could actually be embedded within the target organs and the fibers of the postganglionic um, neurons are very very short and those synapse with the effectors so here's your cranial division of the parasympathetic response oculomotor nerve number three results in constriction of the pupil and rounding of the lens for better vision that's the parasympathetic response the glands of the body are stimulated um, by this particular branch so facial nerve number seven stimulates secretions from salivary glands tears nasal glands glossopharyngeal nerve number nine stimulates the parotid gland also a salivary gland then you have the vagus nerve number 10 that represents 90 percent of all parasympathetic response so you have these various plexuses so the cardiac plexus slows the heart rate pulmonary plexus causes vasoconstriction of bronchial passageways the esophageal plexus regulates swallowing and the abdominal aortic plexus innervates the liver pancreas stomach small intestines kidney ureter and proximal half of the colon the rest of the colon and pelvic organs are innervated by the sacral division of the parasympathetic um, nerves so the sacral part serves pelvic organs and distal half of the large intestine and it comes from neurons in the lateral gray matter of s2 through s4 and the axons travel in the ventral root of spinal nerves and what happens here is because you have each individual presynaptic neuron going almost to the postsynaptic neuron which is really close to the individual organs that they innervate there's not that much divergence here there's individual stimulation of effectors so with the parasympathetic response it's not a full body response it's more of an individual or organ type of activity there's your cranial nerves what they innervate and there's your sacral branch of that cranial sacral division involved in the parasympathetic response now we go to neurotransmitters so neurotransmitters we talked a little bit about in um, chapter 11 but we want to mention first of all that there are names for the fibers or the axon terminals that release these neurotransmitters and if the neurotransmitter released is acetylcholine those fibers are called cholinergic fibers and where do you find these type of fibers all autonomic nervous system preganglionic axons all parasympathetic postganglionic axons at the effector synapse and then you have adrenergic fibers that release the neurotransmitter norepinephrine and these are most sympathetic postganglionic axons so here's a picture we've seen this picture before but we were looking at it before to see the difference between um, the somatic nervous system having one neuron in the chain and then we looked at autonomic nervous systems having two neurons in the chain now let's talk about the neurotransmitter so the sympathetic system at the preganglionic fibers they release acetylcholine postganglionic fibers release norepinephrine and in the parasympathetic division preganglionic fibers release acetylcholine and postganglionic fibers release acetylcholine so the only place you really have a difference is right here and that's the postganglionic fibers in the sympathetic response so now we want to talk about receptors so the receptors are either going to be on the postganglionic soma the nerve cell bodies of those postganglionic neurons 
or we're talking about the effectors themselves, okay? So there's two types of receptors that bind acetylcholine. The first one is called nicotinic. Now the nicotinic type of receptors are found normally on the postsynaptic neuron cell bodies, or if there's one neuron in the chain, then the effector is nicotinic. For instance, like skeletal muscles. Nerves that go out right to skeletal muscles, the receptors that bind acetylcholine are called nicotinic receptors. Now, if you have two neurons in the chain, which you do with the autonomic nervous system, the second one is called muscarinic. And these receptors are named after drugs that bind them and mimic acetylcholine's effects. So nicotinic is named for nicotine, and muscarinic is named for muscarin. And muscarin is a poison that's, find, that's found in um, mushrooms, poisonous mushrooms. And it overstimulates um, effectors in the parasympathetic response, and it results in things like blurred vision, vasoconstriction, uh, sal excessive salivation, sweating, tearing, uh, bradycardia, slowing of the heart rate, um, um, excessive abdominal uh, activity, and 5% of all cases result in death. The remedy is atropine. So that's, that's muscarin, um, just to give you a little background on it. So nicotinic receptors, we said earlier, they're found on the sarcolemma of skeletal muscle cells. We talked about that in Chapter 9 at the neuromuscular junction. All postganglionic neurons, sympathetic and parasympathetic, and hormone-producing cells of the adrenal medulla, because that's another place where you have one neuron connecting to an effector. The effect of acetylcholine at nicotinic receptors is always stimulatory. It opens ion channels and depolarizes the postsynaptic cell. Muscarinic receptors are found on effector cells stimulated by postganglionic cholinergic fibers. Like I said, it's the second it's the second receptor in the pathway. So the effect of acetylcholine at muscarinic receptors can be either inhibitory or excitatory. It really depends on the receptor type of the target organ. Now we look at adrenergic receptors, which are those that bind a norepinephrine. And there's two major classes, alpha with subtypes alpha 1 and alpha 2, and then you have beta, subtypes beta 1, beta 2, beta 3. And the effects of norepinephrine depend on which subclass of receptor predominates on the target organ. Now, this picture puts together a generalization of the efferent pathway of the autonomic nervous system. And I'm just going to walk you through it. Um, and this pulls a lot of inf information together, and we'll tease it out and um, try to make some sense out of this whole thing, kind of reviewing what we've talked about so far. So the presynaptic neuron, or preganglionic neuron, actually starts in the brain of the spinal cord. There's the nerve cell body. Here's the axon. So here's your preganglionic axon, lightly myelinated. It's in blue. And all of the fibers, no matter whether you're talking about um, sympathetic or parasympathetic, they're cholinergic fibers because they release acetylcholine. Now, the first receptor in the chain, or if it's just one nerve, like you find in the adrenal medulla, attached to the adrenal medulla or to skeletal muscles, those are all nicotinic too. The receptors are cholinergic, they're nicotinic receptors, and they bind acetylcholine. Here's where your ganglion is because you have a collection of nerve cell bodies outside the central nervous system here. Now your postganglionic axon is unmyelinated, and those fibers, depending upon whether they are coming from the parasympathetic division or the sympathetic, they're different. So if it's a parasympathetic, they're cholinergic fibers again because they're releasing acetylcholine. If it's the sympathetic system, the fibers are adrenergic because they release norepinephrine. Here's your effector. And remember, your effectors are smooth muscle, cardiac muscle, or glands. So... If this is the second neuron in the chain, then those receptors are called muscarinic receptors and they bind acetylcholine. If we're talking about the sympathetic system, 
then the adrenergic fibers release norepinephrine and their receptors are called adrenergic receptors and they are alpha or beta and so that kind of teases everything apart and reviews what we mentioned earlier about fibers and receptors here's a breakdown of your different types of receptors so here's your cholinergic um, and here's your nicotinic all postganglionic neurons adrenal medullary cells also neuromuscular junctions and skeletal muscle always excitatory muscarinic all parasympathetic target organs um, I'm not going to bother worrying about sweat glands but excitation in most cases inhibition of cardiac muscle and then you get down here to adrenergic and you can see beta 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 alpha alpha and all the different effects of the adrenergic receptors and a lot of times they develop medications and pharmaceutical products that are designed to hit one or more of these receptors to either reduce inflammation um, or oppose like uh, use atropine to cause dilation of the eye when they're doing eye exams things like that so this is just a little bit of breakout you can spend more time with that if you want to just looking at the various receptors so like I said some of the drugs atropine is an anticholinergic type of um, drug it blocks muscarinic acetylcholine receptor receptors used to prevent salivation during surgery and to dilate pupils for examination neostigmine inhibits acetylcholine esterase that breaks down acetylcholine used to treat myasthenia gravis and we talked about that in chapter nine also over-the-counter drugs for colds allergies and nasal congestion uh, they stimulate alpha adrenergic receptors um, constricting blood vessels and reducing inflammation beta blockers are drugs that attach to beta 2 receptors to dilate lung bronchioles and asthmatics and other uses control of autonomic function the hypothalamus is the main integrative center of autonomic system activity um, so the hypothalamus we spent a lot of time with when we were talking about the brain but remember that it controls too um, the emotional brain the limbic system so stress activates the sympathetic response which is going to cause the production of corticotropic releasing hormone from the hypothalamus which in turn is going to cause the anterior produce anterior pituitary gland to produce a C ACTH which is going to stimulate the adrenal medulla gland to produce norepinephrine and epinephrine so the hypothalamus can regulate the stress response there and then you have subconscious cerebral input by limbic system structures on hypothalamic centers um the emotional response and other controls come from the cerebral cortex what you're consciously experiencing at the time if you're going through an emotional time that can have an effect the reticular formation which is the ras um, when you're alert and able to react to stimuli that are is going on around you and um, spinal cord and reflexes so homeostatic imbalances of the autonomic nervous system hypertension um, high blood pressure is an over overactive sympathetic vasoconstriction response to stretch stress and you can treat this with adren adrenergic receptor blocking drugs because in most cases alpha receptors are stimulatory beta receptors are inhibitory and one of the things about the heart is that beta receptors are stimulatory in the heart and alpha receptors are inhibitory and that's why people are prescribed beta blockers if they have an overactive stress response or the heart's working too hard due to some type of problem with those beta receptors being overstimulated um, Raynaud's disease is an exaggerated vasoconstriction in fingers and toes um, and circulations cut off in some cases people have a mild expression of this some people it's more serious um, it can happen uh, activated by stress activated by extreme cold but whichever digits are affected they become very pale um, they can turn kind of cyanotic bluish and, and it can be very painful and usually treated with vasodilators